Welcome people to our show. It's a very nice show. Everyone knows lots of musicians come and go. We call this gash tank. We call this gash tank. <laughs> Stank, as the Germans call it. Both myself, that's Rick Waitman, and my compatriot in crime over there, Mr. Tony Ashen, are really knocked out that our next guest can make it. Because Tony, of course, just loves his music, and uh, Alvin Lee, who it is, owes me a fiver. Alvin Lee. Yo! We're ready to rock and roll! <laughs>
First time I met you, uh, which you most probably might remember, was in the, the wonderful days when I was on my very first tour with Yes, and we were third in the bill to ten years after. Uh, there was Jay Giles band in the middle, which is out in LA. We had the wonderful 25 minute spot, which I'm sure you went through as well. Uh, and I was actually, this is no bullshit, I was very actually stunned by, I couldn't believe there was like 18,000 people just absolutely going bananas when you wandered on the stage. What year was that? 71. 71. I, uh, it was great. It kind of built up slowly. To tell you the truth, I went off it. I used to call them the concrete obelisks because of the sound you got. I really prefer playing kind of 3,000-seater club. I mean, really, like the marquee. It's, just, it's not that big. But you know, when you get the sweat dripping off the walls and the sound goes... Doof. And you go in them big ice hockey stadiums and the sound, and you play a chord and it goes And, you know, the first 50 rows can see you and there's little specks at the back. And it seemed a bit strange to me, but of course, in 69 I did that Woodstock thing, right? And we did the, uh, did the gig and it was great. And then it was a year later, the movie came out. And then it wasn't until the movie came out that, that it made a big thing of it. It was the movie that broke the band. Lot. It broke us into that big market, but in fact, we it preferred the audiences we got before. We see, we were playing to kind of what we called heads in those days, you know, leather jackets, mm. beards, blues, as used to do a bit of blues and a bit of jazz. And um, then suddenly it was like 14 uh, year olds running down the aisles with ice creams, and, and you know, the gigs were havoc, and also those big gigs at that time. You know, there was like problems with uh, security. Did you find any sort of uh, problems with the fact that you being Alvin Lee were the main person in 10 years after they came to see? Did you have any animosity within the band? Well, there was a bit, but I, tr I mean, it wasn't supposed to be that way. But I mean, I could sing and play lead guitar, you know, I mean, that's uh, kind of natural that... You know, Is that what finally followed the band or what? No, not really. Everybody got, we got over toured. You know, when a band breaks, mm. I mean, when you start off, all, you, all you're trying to do is fill your gig sheet, right? If you can get six nights a week, you're raving. Mm -hmm. And then when the band broke, you know, we were like, played for about three years, six days a week, and nobody had time to think, and we had no time to write new tunes, and everybody started grumbling a bit, and, and the, you know, the, the heart went out of it. Ash and I have had the, the lucky choice of bringing the people that we wanted to the programme to play, and it's nice to get back to what we call, and this is no offence to to newcomers around, some good musicianship, people who can play, and people who've got something to, sort, uh, to talk about. Uh, do you miss that sort of musicianship that's going around now? Uh, in a way, I do. I tend to stick, uh, stick with uh, the kind of Thames Valley gang I know, you know. Yeah, right. But in, in, I, think, I think they're there or they're building, you know, some of the 18, I've had a few bands in, in my studio, mm -hmm. and, you know, like 18-year-old kids, and they can't play great yet, Occasionally you see one that will be doing in a couple of years, you know, mm -hmm. and um, maybe they are there. It's just, you know, the communication problem. If a company came along to you tomorrow and said, would you put, you know, a ten years after back together again to do an album and to maybe do a tour, would you do it? Uh, well, it wouldn't be up to me. I'd say, uh, I'd say, ask everyone else first, because... No, it's, up to, it's up to you because, because theoretically, mm. it's, it's. I wouldn't mind doing a, a one-off thing. I wouldn't particularly like to uh, go off uh, on it all the while. Let's put it so. So I was, I was a record company, and I said to you, I said, Alvin, you're the governor of the ten years after. Know the stuff you've done on your own. But would you put a ten year, a ten years after back together again to do an album and to do a tour? Would you do it? I consider it. I have to ask the chaps. I can think of no better intro. Thanks very much, right, Alvin.
amongst the musicians as well. You notice we've got Howie Casey on sax, which is important that Howie's join us because of the fact that this next track really needs a bit of brass. 
it also needs two drummers. Well, it doesn't actually need two drummers, but it's a damn good excuse to use our next guest. It's J.M. Pace. And this is uh, Ashton's Coming Home song, The Resurrection Shuffle.
was sort of a rare situation at the end of the 60s and the early 70s where there were a few bands, you know, such as Purple and, mm. and ELP, were nice at the time, where a, a drummer actually came through and became a name in his own right. I mean, you and Carl were one of the, well, in fact, were the, were the two drummers that, that people, you know, copied. If they copied us, it's... We copied other people, and if they copy us, it's just a natural progression, you know. Um, I think we were very lucky to be around at a time when uh, music was very exciting, you know. There was a, there was a lot of... Um, all, all the borders had been broken down, and you could do exactly what you wanted. Who um, did you copy? Initially, mm -hmm. Bobby Elliott, Hollies. Really? That's, yeah. that's, that's kind of... Why? Because he had a clean sound. Everybody else was all muddy and flappy, and he had a real sharp sound. Um, that was why. I mean, when I bought the first Purple albums, mm. uh, which well, shows a deep purple, which is going back to the days of Rod Evans and you and were Nick the one, were you? Like yes, I was the mad fool. Yeah. Uh, tracks like Mandrake Root were one of the first first tracks. We actually could hear the drums. You could hear, you know, the drum patterns. Every mistake, yes. Going, just I've got to ask you because there was a single that was released over here that very few people know about, uh, which was Emeretta. Yeah. Mm which finished up with a drum solo, which was most unusual for a, a single to finish up with that. Yeah, well, that was, that was really because the song was so... Um, so simple in itself, and it was written so quickly because, you know, contractual obligations. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't think of an ending, and the easiest thing to do is for everybody just to stop playing and leave me fiddling around in tempo, you know, fade. And there was no, there was no great sort of thought of putting a drum solo in there. I mean, so we really couldn't think of an ending. <laughs> Was that on on the you know when you first went to America? It's one of the first English bands to break in America. Yeah. Did you uh, were you aware, for example, when you did uh, you know some of the American TV programs, which most bands never did after that? Yeah. That people were actually watching, expecting you to do something special. Well, we didn't know. We were sort of like lambs to the slaughter over there. I mean, it was first time, you know, the, the great big US, and we just did as we were told. Um, the record company man said, this will be good for your exposure, this will sell you records. Well, we didn't know, you know, we didn't know a thing, so we just said yes to everything. I mean, How so did you join Purple? I joined Purple by uh, Richie having seen me play in a year, having seen me played a year earlier in the Star Club in Hamburg. Um, he just thought I was the most over-the-top thing he'd ever seen. Um, and when he put Purple together, the singer who was in my band, that was Rod Evans, applied for the job with Purple, and Richie put two and two together and said, is that drummer still with you? And Rod said yes, and so Richie said, bring him along. And the name Purple came from the song? Yeah, it did, really. Richie's grandma used to play it. I think it was the last thing she played before she snuffed it, actually. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> that impressive, eh? Yeah, yeah. really. That, uh, yeah. When Purple folded, how did you feel? Um... At the time it folded, I wasn't very sad at all. I mean, so the whole thing had gone upside down. The people involved were not functioning as they should function. Uh, what I think should have really happened for the good of everybody and maybe for the, for the good of music itself was that when Richie left, we should have said, OK, look, everybody go and do what they want to do and we'll come back every two years and we'll make a record, we'll do a tour, we'll have fun and we'll still be able to keep our, you know, our sort of sanity by doing things we want to do ourselves. Um, I think it was a very naive move and a very silly move just to say that's the end of it. We tried one more time with Tommy Bowling, um, who played really well, but the, the chemistry did not happen. Now you've had the experience of, and the chance of working with other musicians as well, would you like to, to carry on doing that or would you like to put a purple back together again? What yeah. could we do? You know, we could be playing the hits and the, the popular things from 10 years ago. And if it's just nostalgia, then the only real reason music to do it is for the it's, it's money. The money in your what hand. About white snake. Well, that's that's gone on to a new thing now because I've left that. Um, they're going to tour nine or ten months of the year, and I'm not prepared to do that anymore. I have other interests in my life, um, and that doesn't, you know, I don't really want to spend nine or ten months a year in a hotel room. There are other things for me to do. So whatever they're going to do is great. I'm having fun now with Gary Moore. We're having fun. We're, we're making music that I'm enjoying. Um, it's, it's a nice, not temporary arrangement, but neither is it a permanent one. I mean, so mm -hmm. we both look at it as well. We're both having fun, and it, and it is paying for itself that we'll carry on. 
What about fronting your own band, an Ian Pace band? Thought about that? I've thought about it, but for a drummer to do that, it really is very difficult. For somebody who doesn't sing, doesn't write, doesn't actually play any other instrument, um, I, it's it's a it's, it's a lie, really, isn't it? You know, yeah. fronting your own band when you you know it's not it's not. On. But you want to carry on playing. You want to carry on working. Oh yeah, yeah. But I I, I want to do it on my terms. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've I've earned that right through the years of, of hard work in the past and, and the luck of success, I've earned the right to pick and choose my time and my place. Um, and while I do it like that, I'll, I'll always enjoy it. And when think I'm enjoying it, I'll play well. If I, don't, if I don't enjoy it, I don't play well. The thing that's interesting is I can count myself as one of them. I know at least half a dozen others that feel exactly the same as you do. Mm. And it's nice for situations like we have in Gas Tank, hopefully, for those sort of people to get together and play and maybe produce some sort of music without having the pressures and the problems that... Uh, that That's right, you until you come up with a, a thing like we have to play today. Sorry about that. The, uh, the Brain Strangler, yes. Yeah. Thanks very much indeed, Ian. And, I, and uh, please come back again and uh, I hope the cheque clears. Certainly. Could you make it £10 next time? Oh, right. OK, mate. Yeah. Fantastic. We smile at each other forever now. Yes. <laughs> During rehearsals, yes, we do have rehearsals. Ian Pace said to me, he said, uh, it's very difficult to get other percussion and drums on a TV programme, so why don't we just knock up a piece that sort of enhances the prowess that I've got? Well, he made the check out the cash, and we wrote this piece of music. And during the recording, uh, I say rehearsal, I should say, uh, our producer and director, Mr Paul Knight, who wants a name check, and also Jerry, walked in and said, is it all together? And we said, possibly. We realised that we hadn't got a name for this piece of music. It's called Possibly. <laughs> We've dug up Captain Tucky, who actually discovered a lot of the Thames and some of the boats down beneath it. He also became part and parcel of a very famous husband and wife team. 
we actually got accused on this program of not really having enough of the female variety of musicians on the program. So we dug up Susie Quattro. And this is where the connection comes in, because she's married to Captain Tucky. He's the one who plays the guitar. We've also dragged in Steve Hackett, who plays the harmonica, not normally, but does on this occasion. And Susie's the one who sings My Babe. Maggie Bell. She didn't play an instrument. Not that. Oh. 
Okay, we're going to do something. This is originally recorded by uh, Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels a long time ago, and Roy Buchanan did a superb version of it, so that's what we're going to do. C.C. Ryder. that uh, the Quattro family, which is not that well known in England, except for one person, which is Susie. But you have a, a sister and a brother who, in fact, are very well known 
the other side of the Atlantic. Actually, I've got, let me see, there's four girls and one boy. Um, the one that you're talking about is Patty, mm -hmm. who is six foot tall, which, as you can see, bears a strong resemblance to me. Um, and she played lead guitar and fanny. And my brother, Mickey, plays keyboards. Mm -hmm. And my other sister, Arlene, was a keyboard player and played in our band for a while. And the little sister studied opera and was a singer and bass player in our band for a little while as well. So, and my dad's a musician. So how did you end up over here? Uh, BOIC, British Airways. Very good. And at the end of round one, Joan Crawford. <laughs> No, how did, no, seriously, how did, you, how did you end up over here? Um, I was in a band from the age of 14, which is 1964 up until 1970. And mm -hmm. Mickey Most came to Detroit with Jeff Beck to record the album that never got released at the Motown Studios. It was redone again. Mm -hmm. And I forget which album it was now, Truth? Mm -hmm. Anyway, he came over to Detroit to do that. My band was playing a gig. He came to the gig and sort of went to me, back of the hall. Do you the want band to make was called what? Cradle. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I wasn't even lead singer at the time. I was just the bass player, and I sang one song which I'd written. Um, and he called me back and he said, "Are you interested in recording?" And I said, "Yes." And he said, "Would you like to come to England?" And I said, "Yes." And I left. I was only supposed to be here for three months, and that was October of '71. It's now what? 12 January '82. Something like '83. '83. Yes, '83. Like yeah. So when you came here, did you, did you decide to stay here, or did you want to go back, or what? Or did you meet no. Len? I, well, a bit of everything. I didn't want to go back because I was smart enough to know that uh, Mickey was giving me my first break, which is basically mm -hmm. what it was. You know, when somebody says to you, singles you out. And I'd been waiting for that chance all my life to go on my own and be a, a solo performer. Um, and then I got really fed up not doing gigs because we were just recording all the time. In fact, I was going stir crazy. So Mickey said, go out and find yourself a band, which is where Captain Tucky comes in. Mm -hmm. um, I hired a, a drummer and a keyboard player, and I got rid of one flash guitar player who I didn't like. Gave me a bit of lip. I don't like people talking back to me. So, um... That clears the <laughs> interview up. <laughs> so, Lenny showed up for the audition at 12 o'clock at night. I, got, I woke him up from bed. His friend called him and said, can you come mm -hmm. and audition for this girl's band? He knew who I was. Um, he walked in, and I, and I was being my really tough self, and I kind of went, Woo. Oh, hello. So he was really pleased to see me. Anyway, we started talking, <laughs> and I said, I didn't want any flash guitar players. I just wanted somebody who had that rock and roll feel, and I, I was mm -hmm. really insistent on that. And he didn't say anything. He was very quiet. The only time he's ever been quiet since I've known him. And then we went to the rehearsal hall and played. This is sounding like a love story now, isn't it? Anyway, we jammed till about 5 in the morning, and that was it. And he was in my band. And then two weeks later, on the Slade tour, we were in love. <laughs> oh, isn't that sweet? And now, uh, <laughs> 10 years later... Yes. You got a little girl, yes. Laura. Yeah. Has that changed? You know, the music changed uh, your style, changed even your feeling about rock and roll. No, it, it hasn't changed anything about that. All it does is add a different dimension to your life. You, instead of thinking you, you, you all the time, you've got another person there. That's all. But she's going to be a rock and roller. I'm convinced. You say you're convinced. I mean, there's some little thing that I did find out about you. You are very into star signs, which is something we've not had on this program at all. Yeah, I am. Actually. Very skeptical, but you are very into that. You're skeptical. Yeah, I'm skeptical on star signs. Uh, Len, what's he? He's Sagittarius. Shall I tell you what Len is supposed to be? Well, what he's supposed to be, I mean, he did ho actually hold my hand in the dressing room before we started. Now, what is he meant to be? Maybe he's not what I thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> he's not a Virgo, I tell you that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Edit. No, what's he, what, what's okay. he supposed to be? He's supposed to be an outdoor man, which he is. He mm -hmm. um, loves shooting and everything. You never can cage a Sagittarian. A Sagittarian must feel free at all times. Um, when they're having a good time, you cannot drag them away, ever. Mm -hmm. um, very outspoken, sort of, if there's a comment to be said, they will say it. And they point arrows to your heart at the truth. You never get any bullshit from a Sagittarian. What they about, will tell you exactly what's what. What about, what about music on the star signs? Any chance of uh, the whole Quattro family getting back together again? No, Did we're so different. There's a Pisces, a Virgo, a Gemini. A Sagittarius, which is okay. Well, Ashton would like to meet the Virgo. Pardon? And so, uh, I'll clear that one up. <laughs> Susie, thanks for coming on. Tremendous. Thank you. Bless you. You didn't ask where I was. Gemini. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>